sir. This is uh, Fred Simino from Profile, and today I'm talking with Steve Babb from Glasshammer. How are you doing? Doing fantastic today. Thank you for having me. It's Friday. It's Friday, right? It's a great day, yeah. Going to, <laughs> I'm going to go see a movie tonight. Uh, Glasshammer's brand new album, Chronomenot, uh, has just been released on October 12th. Uh, first, congratulations, but let Thank me you. ask you, like, how do you explain such a longevity? I mean, you formed the band back in 92. You've released 17 studio album. That is quite something. Yeah, um, and I think it's 18. Um, I keep reading 17, but I counted the other day, and it was 18. But it doesn't matter. Let's go 18. Like, yeah, well, why not? Um, my first bet was 18, so for some reason I read 17 and I changed my mind. But I went to iTunes and counted. I've tried. I don't know. I don't. I can't remember. <laughs> uh, so, really, even though we have the appearance of of a band frequently, and I think of it that way, uh, it's always been uh, mostly a co-write and co-produced project with Fred Schindel and myself. And we have a, a, I would say, a peculiar working relationship. We, we get along. Uh, we kind of know each other's roles. So we don't, uh, we don't have a lot of disagreements about what to do or how to do it. Minor. Um, so the only two people that have to be happy creatively are Fred and myself. And we work together practically every day in a recording studio. So we're here doing this anyway. Uh, and we are very proud of Glasshammer and we want to keep going and it's, it's good for us. So, you know, it's 25 years, wow. you know, almost 26. Um, and, you know, uh, Susie's been with us, uh, you know, maybe not as visible, but she's been with us, recording with us since 2000. You know, so she's been there for a while. And then we've got the most solid drummer in the world, uh, Aaron Ralston. And uh, we're a pretty tight group. Great. The new album, uh, Chronomenot, is Chronometry follow-up. Mm -hmm. uh, this album was released back in 2000. Uh, what are the reasons why you decided to write a part two? And please explain a little bit about the theme of these two albums and how do they relate to each other? Well, Chronometry was supposed to be a tongue-in-cheek parody of all prog rock fans, ourselves included. So it's about a guy named Tom who takes his music and his lyrics so seriously uh, that he um, uh, begins to think that aliens are communicating with him. And uh, they're teaching him how to build a time machine. And, and the weird part of that story is it is based on someone Fred Schindel knew. Uh, so there's a little bit of truth, quite a bit of truth to that story. But he, the, the character of Tom, as a fictional character at least, seemed to really stand for all, all of us when we were 17 or 18 and we were first really listening to our prog albums and we took them serious. Uh, so I, and people really liked the album. It was a big hit for us. Yeah. So years go by, and then what happened for me was, uh, I think when some of our heroes began to die, like uh, Chris Squire and Keith Emerson and Rick, uh, not Rick, thankfully, um, um, Greg Lake, David Bowie, some of those guys, uh, John Wetton. Uh, I th it, that affected all of us, again, fans and bands alike. And I began to think, well, how would that affect this guy that wants to time travel? Well, how would that affect Tom as a character? Uh, and I thought this might be a, a really fun idea of looking back or having our character look back in time and wish he could go back to the glory days of progressive rock and try to be a prog rock star himself. So now it's gone from being about prog um, fans taking the music too seriously. It's actually about prog musicians taking it too seriously. So it's a, it's, it's a, it's an easier concept to explain musically. 
than it is for me to explain it to you because it probably just sounds insane. Yeah. But if you read the lyrics and listen to the music and follow along, with, there's actual storyline in the liner notes. Um, it becomes something that's that's pretty funny actually. So, so it's it's not something that you you had in mind for a very long time to write the chapter two. It's 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 something that was developed like in the last probably year or so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was, um, I began to write some music for this last summer, but I still didn't know what it would be just yet. And then I ran the idea by uh, Fred, and then my wife, uh, Julie, is very involved and helps us run our business. And she also, you know, if the two of them sign off on it, then it's a go. Uh, and they both thought, yeah, let's try it. Let's see. Let's see how it goes over. And it's going over really good. What? Yeah. what What does the title mean, Chronomenot? Uh, you know, it's kind of, um, I kind of wanted to keep it complicated like the previous title. No one could ever pronounce chronometry. Especially uh, for a French guy. Yeah, right. So <laughs> Chronomenot means like he's a, he's, you know, he's, chrono is time or chronos yep. is time. So he's, he's like an astronaut of time. He's going to time travel. I started to do it. And spell it N O T, which is not like chronoma not. But uh, I just let's just make him like an astronaut of time, or that's what he wants to be. So he doesn't succeed, of course. <laughs> that's very interesting. <laughs> and where the first story was, like I said, it was based on somebody Fred knew when he was a teenager uh, or early twenties. Uh, this is completely made up. It's just it's just fun. Uh, when listening to the new songs, uh, two things came to my mind real quick. One, the bass guitar and the keyboard sounds amazing. Uh, more than ever, I can hear a mix of genre, i.e. some gentle giants to mm -hmm. Beatles, mm -hmm. jazz to he even heavy metal, like near yeah. the end of the album. Uh, please walk us through the writing process of, of such an album. Um, well... There was a one song on the last album called Nexus Girl that was kind of a sudden departure. It was about a three minute long track, just instrumental, and it was kind of a post rock sound. And people loved it, um, went crazy about it. And I thought, well, why not make the whole album several songs like Nexus Girl? They're all surprises. They're all different kinds of things that we're influenced by. It doesn't have one big sound to it. And pretty much everything that Fred and I do will always sound like Glass Hammer one way or the other. But we are influenced by a lot of different things. Uh, and um, it just seemed like a good time to do something, especially with an album about time travel, go back and do some kind of psychedelic pop stuff, uh, do some old grungy metal like that first track. Uh, which reminds me of a band called Blood Rock uh, from the early 70s, just some creepy old sounds. Um, and then do some 80s synth. Uh, it's called Synthwave now, but we think of it as Tangerine Dream and um, uh, like the music of John Carpenter. So it's just kind of a look at different periods of musical history. There's Chicago influences. We added brass. That was another big thing Fred did uh, was had this... Uh, we had some brass, a uh, brass section in the studio uh, for another guy we were produ producing, and it was fun to do. Fred arranged it, and it was a lot of fun. He's like, let's put brass on everything in this album. Nobody's ever done that. And we ended up just doing two songs. But it gives, you know, it's the first time I've heard Chicago uh, kind of married with progressive rock. So it's just a lot of interesting, fun things on there. And... We might do another album like that. There's lots of kind of music we like. So. Uh, as mentioned, Chronomenaut is your 18th studio album and is uh, sure very, very well received by the fans and the critiques. Uh, more often than not, than not, artists are at the top of their creativity, sorry, creativity in the early years of their career, but your last six albums have had a lot of success. Um, like through reviews, uh, which were outstanding, and uh, the fans really liked it. So, did you keep the best for last, or like how how 
How does that work? As in, as in each album's better, or? Well, it looks like oh. every, every album surpass the previous one with Glass Hammer. Thank you. Um, it's not, we're, I mean, we always want to, it's, it's hard to explain. There's been a couple of times where we attempted to outdo the previous album. And, that, and I don't think that really worked. So we just do the kind of album that we want to do at the time that we do it. And I think some of our recording techniques get better. And maybe we're becoming better songwriters. Um, that doesn't happen for everybody. Maybe we started out so bad that, no, you know. You did now, not. You know <laughs> um, That's not what I meant. Yeah. No, well, yeah, it's hard to explain. We, we just... I think we learn every time we do an album, and there's 50 things we wish we hadn't have done, and so we eliminate those things the next time, and maybe that's making it better. Uh, I still go back and I hear some things we've done on different albums, and I feel like, well, no, we haven't passed that up at all. I've heard a couple of things the other day that I thought, wow, I missed that. Um, so I don't know. We just we change a little bit. Maybe it's sort of fresh to the ears. I don't know. Hope it keeps working. We still want to do more albums. So. Yeah. I know you've, you've talked briefly about it, but the next question is kind of inevitable. Uh, there have been many changes of personnel since your first album 25 years ago. Uh, the singer Carl Groves has come, gone, come, gone again. John Davison has gone to another gig with Yes, Alan... It uh, looked like he was going to ensure stability at the guitar, but he's gone too. So yeah. How do you explain like all these changes? Uh, I think, you know, we, we, start, we start at every project. Well, every few years, we sort of become a studio project. And so that happened many years ago uh, when Walter Moore was our singer. And then he had some difficulties. Uh, and we drafted Carl Groves, um, and it was kind of, it felt temporary, but we kept working with him. So it wasn't anything. That, the membership in the band isn't something that's set in stone. It's just while you're here and you're happy and you want to do it with us, then you know we're a team. If you don't want to proceed, that's fine. We'll we'll pick up and we'll move on. Uh, Susie and Aaron are very happy right now with us and. I guess they'll continue to work with us. But being in a recording studio all day, we meet musicians all day long. That's how we met Susie, and that's how we met Aaron. So if, if somebody decides they don't want to be involved, there's other people that might be interested. So uh, it's really kind of a vehicle for Fred and I to write and record. Then when we are invited to go out and play, suddenly it has to become a band, and you'll see that kind of a, an image of you know four or five people. I'm sure if we go out and do any more shows, there'll be a, a guitar player added in a more per permanent position than we have right now. Okay, so besides Susie, Matthew, Parmenter, and Patton, uh, who share the lead vocal duties, we see no less than four guitar players on Chronomenaut. Is that what we should expect for the near future with Glass Hammer? And like, what are the challenges when it comes to play life? Well, the challenge would be grabbing one of those guys or somebody else. And but you think about it this way: it's it's Fred and I both write on mostly on keyboards. I usually have a bass in my lap when I write, but it's I'm playing keyboards. So this is thick keyboard music. Uh, and guitar is always something that we add in. Okay. Uh, yeah. So it's not. It's ne never going to be a heavy metal group where everything's going to be contingent upon who's the guitarist. So uh, you know, we we would find somebody and and they would learn the music and they would fit in and we would do great. I'm sure. Now having four players this time, like uh, one of the favorites on this album, are two tracks that Brian Brewer. Did and he works here about three days a week, and he plays blues and country. He has no idea what progressive rock is, and in fact, the first time he ever heard our album was recently, 
uh, when he was on it. Now we've been friends with him for 15 years and he's wow. played on a number of projects. But I know what he sounds like. And when I wanted to do a couple of sound, songs that made me think of Bowie and some old 70s stuff, I'm like, let's get Brian. He comes in and, and just kind of nails it. Chris Heron from uh, Discipline, he has he's a great standard prog rock player. He knows exactly what he's doing, so we hand him the proggy tunes. Uh, a new guy from Atlanta uh, showed up, uh, and uh, he's just 18, uh, 18 years old, and he's kind of an Alex Lifeson guy. Nice. Uh, so he did good. And then another guy from the UK that I just heard, he followed us on Twitter. I checked him out, and I'm like, oh, this guy would be good for this song. So it was kind of cool because there was not a lot of pressure on any of these guys. All they had to do was a couple of songs, uh, and so they didn't. It wasn't like we had to ask too much of them. It wasn't stressful for them. And then we got to pick the best guitar player for the best song. So it's win-win for everybody on Chronomenon. We've also witnessed uh, quite a few changes of style through, you know, in recent years. Are you going to surprise us again in the near future? And what does that future look like for Glasshammer? Um, I, would, I don't think that we would ever do something out of left field. Like uh, years ago, we did, uh, when we did Three Cheers for the Broken Hearted, it really threw people off. They thought, oh my gosh, they've changed. What have they done? Um, and I don't think we'll ever do that again. I think we're always going to be a symphonic 70s influenced prog rock band that hopefully gets to experiment and throw some cool ideas in. Uh, but we don't have any desires to go beyond that. I do think, you know, there's other things we're influenced by, and I do think you'll hear those things show up in the music later. But always within the context of prog. Like Fred and I, are both we both love funk, classic 70s funk. Uh, and I want, to, I want to get that influence in somehow one day. But it wouldn't be like a 17-minute long epic funk song. You know, it's going to be prog with a break in the middle of it. Yeah. So, well, I, I, and I do think we have that kind of Beatle thing going on sometimes, ballad writers, you know. But nothing, I, you know, I think Glasshammer's kind of got a thing. It's only taken 25 years to figure that out. So, uh, Can we expect a live show on Blu-ray at some point? Is the cost prohibitive? Uh, I just looked at it like um, I know how many albums sell versus how many DVDs, and I... Um, you know, I think I, I looked at doing a Blu-ray maybe the last time when we did, um, we did a Rosfest DVD and yeah, maybe it was, it's just, I don't think I could justify printing DVD because I, I asked people, what do you want? Yeah. And get about this many answers that I want a Blu-ray, this many I want a DVD and My I could, and I don't, all oh, right. And it just. I cannot make everybody happy, so uh, we've got four DVDs out right now. We're not the most photogenic group on the, on the planet, so it's my, it might be best if everybody just listens to us for a while. Uh, a lot of people will disagree to that, but... Uh. It's, it's fun to play live, and I, I love to be filmed, and um, you know, I'm sure we'll do it again one day. On a uh, personal note, like what were the challenges back in the years compared to today, you know, for being a musician in the progressive rock scene, for sure? Well, like our character Tom and Chronomenot, uh, in the early 80s, I was in a prog rock metal band. Uh, and it was a local group. So we're talking 1980 through 83. Uh, and of course, we were, kind of, we were kids. Uh, and challenges, you know, well, we couldn't get signed, you know, that was not going to happen. So we're kind of born at that wrong period of time yeah. where, uh, 10 years earlier, we would have been geniuses, you know, yeah. uh, but suddenly we get into Prague right about the time it dies as a genre. And it took another 10 years before Fred and I said, the heck with it, let's do it anyway. And so some, like, I guess about 1993, 
having no belief that anyone would ever hear our first album, we did it. Wow. Because I just wanted to say I did it. I, I, like, I waited all my life. This is the kind of music I want to do. And it just didn't matter. It was the first thing in our lives that really ever worked was when we threw caution to the wind, did exactly what we wanted to do, and suddenly people took notice. So it just took a lot of time. That's the challenge for us. That's, and that's part of this whole Tom story. It's kind of our story in a weird way. That's good to know. Like, yeah, yeah we, we wanted to be prog rock stars, and we were just born maybe just 10 years too late to do that. So we're, we're uh, I call us minor league prog rock stars now. Do you think uh, prog rock is healthier? Uh, that's hard. I mean, to I mean, today compared to like the '90s or something. Yeah, I think so. Well, it was exciting in the '90s because we were all finding each other. Like suddenly there were bands, suddenly there were fans, there were magazines in it, and it, it was. I think in a way it was easier. Um, it was easier. Fortunately for us, we started right when that happened. And everybody knows who we are. Um, ten years later, and we would just be one band in a sea of bands. It's, I think it's probably really hard for a young band now to cut through. Uh, you've got to really have some label push, and there's only a handful of labels that can do that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's easier for us to maintain what we have than if I were 30, you know, or 25, and trying to start this again right now. It would be tough. Very interesting uh, response. Um, we're near the end of the uh, interview, but I, I always ask questions that uh, will require only one word answers. Okay. So you want to play the game? Uh, yeah, I'll play the game. Let's All right. One, this is kind of scary. No, you don't. Don't. No need to be scared because if you want to pass, you just say pass and I'll okay. move on to the next okay. question. Okay. They're easy uh, questions. Okay. Uh, one. You need to promote your band with only one Glass Hammer album. Which one do you recommend? The Inconsolable Secret. Nice. How, now you need to promote the band with only one song. Which one would it be? Having Caught a Glimpse from The Inconsolable Secret. Yeah, that's a very good song. What band contributed to the fact that you have become a musician? Rush. Rush. Canadian band. Oh, yeah. Beside Chronomenot, what is the last album you've listened to in its entirety? Um, in its entirety, Beck. Um, maybe two albums ago. Can't think of the name of the album. Okay. But. Okay. Yeah. The, the one bass guitar you wish you were the owner of? Rickenbacker, four string. Maybe 1965, something like that. Oh, nice. Yeah. Uh, is it the intention to release a best of album in the near future? No. Still working on the best. <laughs> Love that. You're being told that you can pick any musician to participate on your next project. Who would that be? Fred Schindel. Uh, sorry, I missed that? Fred Schindel. Oh. A safe answer. How's that? <laughs> uh, Pink Floyd, Genesis, or Gentle Giant? Pink Floyd. And last question. Do you read online and magazine reviews of your own album that you've released? Every every review, yes. You do, eh? Yeah, I do. Hey, Steve, that's it. Okay, man. For the, uh, the, the interview, uh, it was a pleasure to talk to you and to see you again. Good to see you again, too. And wish you the best, best, best success with Chronomenaut. It's a great album, and I'm sure uh, people will love it. Yeah, thank you so much, Fred. I'm glad we got it to work. Thank you, sir. All right. Examine the ride. You'll find it's all about time. The time's not your friend. When
it's threatening to end. Search out and 